The time for liberal education is a time to withdraw from the world of contemporary power struggles. Um, that said, and I think this fits nicely with what the way we've been talking, that said, there is a way in which liberal education is extremely politically relevant. And that is that it's an education of a free person, that is, of a citizen. It, it's the education which gives you, uh, develops your power of judgment to participate in your community as a free member. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Johnny Burtka. We are joined today by Zena Hitz, who is a tutor at St. John's College in Annapolis, as well as the founder and president of the Catherine Project. She writes for general audiences about freedom, education, happiness, the decline of our institutions, faith, hope, and love. Zena's scholarship is in classical philosophy, especially questions about law, character, friendship, and the human good. With the beginning of the semester rolling around, we are talking about the about liberal education, modern colleges, and human, human happiness. Thanks for being here, Zena. It's great to be here, Johnny. Thanks so much for inviting me. Of course. And before we begin this conversation, I want to thank you all for joining Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Our mission at ISI is to educate for liberty. If you'd like to help us in fulfilling our mission, be sure to rate and review this podcast to help us reach more listeners like yourself. So Zena, to to start out, I'm wondering if you could share a bit about your general background, what your own education was like, and how did you take an interest in liberal learning? Well, uh, in some sense, it came naturally to me. Um, I grew up in a family of bookworms, um, not professional learners, and I, I do think it's crucial for liberal learning that it be something that we envision for everyone um, mm. as, as part of ordinary life. It's, it's not just for um, what are now called elites uh, or, or the ruling class. Um, and uh, then I went to uh, the great liberal arts college, St. John's, as an undergraduate, um, and, um, you know, loved it and, and flourished there in many ways. Um, immediately afterward, I did not continue in what you would call a, a liberal education angle. I, I went into professional, okay. professional research academia um, and learned uh, about all the things that I hadn't learned at St. John's. Um, all of the, I got, I feel like I was very privileged. I got all of the, the wealth blessings, the learning that you can get in, in professional academia. Um, and then um, found my way back into thinking about liberal education through a, a gradual um, disillusionment with professional academia. Um, hmm. And uh, that's what I write about in, in my book, uh, Lost in Thought, in the preface, um, how I found my way uh, eventually to, to thinking about Uh, how to recover that love of learning I'd had as a young person and how to bring all of my professional uh, skills, talents, et cetera, back to the the realm of of liberal learning and and the study of the great books. So for the past eight years, I've been back at St. John's teaching and uh, feels like home to me. So uh, that's, that's where I've been and that's the place from which I've been writing about liberal education since then. That's great. And is the the Catherine Project, uh, which is a wonderful uh, organization, is that, I assume it's an extension of your your work at St. John's? What was the motivation for the Catherine Project? You know, I, I, um, I've I always dreamed of a type of education that was totally open to anybody. Because hmm. one of the things I've learned over the course of my life and my experiences is that there are all kinds of people who are interested in the fundamental questions or interested in the great books who aren't necessarily part of academic institutions. Um, and St. John's, as wonderful as it is, is a small liberal arts college. And that has limitations yeah. as far as, um, I mean, in truth, all kinds of people come. But they all kinds of people turn up at St. John's. But there are plenty of people who either can't or won't go to a small liberal arts college. Um, so the idea of the Catherine Project was just to open up the gates, see who turned up. Um, and one of the things that's happened, um, so it's, it's a free online non-credit 
um, adult great books education. And we, we use small discussion groups. So we try to use mm. Zoom and the online format in, at what it's best at, which is when people are reading offline, thinking offline, and then come to connect in, in small conversations. Um, and one of the things that's turned out about it is that um, contrary to everything you hear in the, in the media about higher education, or certainly from higher education administrators, the demand for gradebooks education is huge. So we, we get, we've had thousands of people who, who come to us looking more, more than, we have more demand than we can possibly meet with our volunteers. That's unbelievable. Um, and um, so we know that the demand is real, um, that it's a transformative for the people who are involved in it, and we see more of that every day. So it's, it's very encouraging in that way. Um, the need for liberal education is out there, the demand for it is out there, and it is still transforming lives even if you're not reading about that in the New York Times. That's, that's fantastic. And I think it's also important. It's important, I think, for people who have not had the chance to have a liberal education, to have the opportunity, but also for those who did have a liberal education, to not just have that be something they did for four years. They have the books on the shelf, and then they're consumed with the busyness of career and family, and they never really think about it again. Um, so I, I'm curious, maybe just to get back to kind of fundamental definitions you know, what is uh, a liberal arts education? What ends are, you know, what is it for? And uh, yeah, maybe we start there. That's a great question. And, and maybe not something, I, I don't know that my answer will be a, a final complete answer. It'll be something tentative. Okay. Um, sure. <laughs> but I, I think of liberal education as being, having two aspects to it. On the one hand, it's for its own sake. Um, it's, this is tr very traditional. It's, it's the learning that belongs to a free person. That is, it's not learning for the sake of practical tasks. It's learning in a way that develops the whole person, the whole human person. Um, and it, it gives you resources that you draw on no matter what your circumstances are, no matter what your line of work is. So, so, so that's, that's one way of putting it. That it's, it's for its okay. own sake. Um, I think the other thing that I've been thinking about a bit more recently is that, and it's in some tension with the first thing, that liberal learning is fundamental types of learning. So you, you gather skills that are basic to all of learning. Okay. So, um, take, so liberal arts, by the way, is not just the humanities, even though it includes philosophy, literature, et cetera. Um, and history and, and political theory. It also includes mathematics um, and certain kinds of natural science. Um, and that's because those studies are fundamental in that way. They, they shape us, they shape our way of thinking about the world, and they shape us and their pursuit for their own sake. But in another way, those, those skills and disciplines lie underneath um, other kinds of disciplines. So. There's a way in which I think the liberal arts are at the core of what should be a university. They're, um, they're, they're the basic disciplines on which everything else depends. Um, so when you're, when you're cutting the liberal arts out of your university, you're cutting out the heart. You're cutting out the thing which makes all of the other disciplines work, um, which ties them all together, which, which, yeah. which provides a foundation for them. Um, so, uh, so it's, it's those two things on the one hand being a foundational type of learning and on the other hand being a type of learning for its own sake. Hmm. I, I like those answers. I, I'm reminded th your point at the end about kind of it being the thing that holds everything together or that, br you know, brings things together in a whole, you know, I remember my, probably my spring year at Hillsdale college. I was taking a, a course on Aristotle's ethics, and I and I do remember this sort of, it was just like an awareness maybe for the first time that everything throughout the whole four years, that I could see it as part of a whole. And it was just, a, you know, and I'm 22, so I'm sure there's lots of that whole that I didn't really get, but it, just the awareness of it emerging as a whole, which was just exhilarating and something everyone should have a, an opportunity to experience. What do you, what's the connection between liberal learning and happiness, would you say? 
Um, <laughs> equality. <laughs> that's a relationship is or identity. That's what a that's a that's a philosopher nerd's uh, answer. Um, so I again, I think there's different kinds of answers. So the traditional answer that goes back to Aristotle and the ethics yeah. is that uh, liberal learning, liberal studies, liberal th thinking for its own sake is happiness. It is happiness mm -hmm. for human beings. It is the highest end. That doesn't mean it's all that we do. Um, sure. It doesn't mean that it's somehow the only thing that's good. It just means that it has a, a fundamental organizing force in, in that we do mm -hmm. all the, thing, the other things that we do for the sake of that. That's one type of answer. Um, I think another type of answer, which is maybe a bit more palatable for, for most people is that it's a way of thinking about what happiness is. So it's a, sure. it, you know, among young people, especially uh, liberal arts education is the place where they uh, are able to really think about the fundamental questions for their lives. What, what matters most, what's worth living yeah. for. Um, and that's, I think also one of the things that makes it essential to, um, to especially undergraduate education. Um, that we we all need time and space to think about wh well what's the what are we going to do with ourselves what's the point of all this yeah. um, whereas a, a lot of more pragmatic minded education uh, assumes that we already know more or less what life is for and just puts us on track to do one thing or the other we never have that space or that time to reflect and think about what the what the meaning of it all is what the purpose of it is yeah that's so. I want to. I'd like to get back to um, in a second, the, or jump to those kind of the issues kind of with contemporary education. But before that, maybe you you had mentioned something about you know thinking thinking being happiness, and I'm curious comparing. Um, I guess the when I think of like liberal arts within the the Western kind of great books context, how other civilizations understand learning if you know similar understandings of the liberal arts have emerged and what um the takeaways are because i think i'm interested obviously in in chinese kind of confucian uh that that area but also if i think about um sort of my own faith background i'm eastern orthodox and one of the things that i've not um quite i guess i don't know if reconciled is the word but i haven't learned enough about it to to learn how to think about it well enough is there's probably maybe less of an emphasis on reason in the orthodox tradition and if you think of sort of what is the center of the human being you know i would say maybe the heart is the center more than the mind although to some extent the mind is perhaps located in the heart if, if you go to mount athos for example and you see these monks praying the jesus prayer and um you know to some extent they're they're clearing their mind and they're sort of sitting in this Mo in this quietness, in this solitude, and when they see their thoughts entering their mind, you know, and, and maybe they're through the Jesus prayer, or other things, they're, they're very centered and they're not, they're, they're, they're going through to some other realm inside of them. So I, what I'm wondering, it, it, there's really not a, um, you know, if you're going to become a saint in the Orthodox Church, it's almost never by being a theologian in, in, in the sense of an academic, right? You become a saint by prayer and asceticism. Um, so I'm not saying that the Orthodox tradition is, is fundamentally at odds with the Western tradition, but how would, how would either the Orthodox or maybe the Chinese or the Indian, like, how does that fit in with the liberal arts and what do you see emerging in those other civilizations? Well, so I, I'm, I'm not an, any, any kind of expert on, um, especially Chinese or Indian civilizations. And I'm, I'm reluctant to, um, to sort of weigh in without having put in enough time and trouble sure. and attention to understanding things and all their nuances. I'll say this as a general matter, and this is, I think is not just about the um, what we'd call the great civilizations, the ones with a long written tradition like the Chinese, the Indian, and the West. You just try to think of every culture that uh, with, there's a central wisdom tradition. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think that in the West... Philosophy is a part of our wisdom tradition. It's not the only part because there's also um, religious, great religious traditions in the West. Uh, Judaism and Christianity and Islam are all, in some way, uh, in that in that European um, Near Eastern sure. core. Um, and uh, but I do think that 
wisdom is central. And I think, of course, for the Eastern Orthodox, which I know a bit more about than I know about the, the Chinese or the, or the Indian, wisdom is fundamental. So Christ is wisdom. Um, Absolutely. And uh, you definitely would say if the monks about Athos that they're wise, that they pursue wisdom, even if you, you, don't, you think of them as moving through the heart rather than through the mind. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's a lot more to say about that. Um, one of the things I'm quite interested in as, as someone who's somewhat acquainted with the Eastern Christian traditions, but not fully uh, as expert as I would like to be, you know, there's a, there's a ton of Plato in mm. uh, the Greek fathers. Um, Definitely. And, in, in, in Orthodox, also in Orthodox prayers. Um, mm -hmm. I, I prayed uh, the Akathist a couple of years ago, this great prayer for the mother of God. And um, there's a passage in there I'm sure is from Plato's Sophist. Um, okay. Which is from the Sophist, you know, which is a very strange thing from a Roman Catholic point of view, very strange yeah, thing yeah. in your liturgy, in your prayer book. So I, I'm sure that there is... Um, that makes me confident that there's not as sharp a divide as one might think. That is, that they are two modes of emphasis. Mm -hmm. um, towards two, the end of wisdom. Towards the same wisdom. end. Yeah. And I, one way to think about that is that, and this is, this is how I would put it, and this is, we're not as good at being rational as we think we are. That is, we, mm -hmm. we, we think that we're being reasonable, we think we're being rational, we think we're doing the prudent thing. In fact, we're just doing what's easiest for us or what's most conventional or what's, um, what mom and dad told us to do or what, the school, what, you know, yeah. what our, our bosses and teachers are telling us we ought to do. Um, whereas real rationality involves uh, asceticism, it involves giving up. Um, and setting aside a huge for, uh, all of our attachments to anything yeah. that presents wisdom, and and to do that um, makes you look like a crazy person. So you know if you know someone like Francis of Assisi from the Western tradition, but there are many many examples. You know um, uh, Saint Anthony of the Desert in the in the Eastern tradition. You know they they give up absolutely everything for a life of prayer and service. It looks crazy. But in fact, it's not crazy. It's, it's perfectly rational because it's the sacrifice of, of various attachments which have nothing to do with wisdom and happiness for the thing that matters most. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, so I want to gesture in that direction of reconciliation. That yeah, is, definitely. Um, we, we don't see this. The difference isn't as sharp when you understand how hard it is to be rational um, mm -hmm. and how many obstacles stand in the way of doing what's best for you. Uh, where doing what's best for you is kind of the cardinal rule of rationality. You know, seek the good. Um, it's hard to do. Yeah. So if, you know, if liberal learning, you know, relates to happiness, this activity of thinking that obviously every human being has the, you know, the, um, the ability to do, I'm curious when it comes to, you know, spreading, li you know, liberal learning out, bringing it to the map. When, when I think of, the democratization of education in America, you think of maybe something like the GI Bill, which also it, it spread educa education, but it also brought about, you know, what Russell Kirk called behem behemoth university. You, the, it sort of took on the likes of uh, Henry Ford you know, assembly line, more career focused uh, job skills, less kind of the contemplative and, and the liberal arts tradition. So, um, you know, is how, how do you go about sort of bringing, uh, you know, democratizing liberal learning, if you could say that, uh, or bring it to the people without um, ruining it or, you know, yeah. Well, I, I think there's is a certain irony in the, the history you, you just outlined, because I, I think there's, I could see how one might think that, that is at the same time that literacy and access to education expand, you also get all kinds of applied learning and you know, mm -hmm. uh, learning for the sake of careers and tra job training in universities, and you get a decline in, in what would be called classical learning or liberal learning. Um, but it's, it's funny, you can tell that something's um, gone off about that story just from the contemporary scene where I think 
certainly from sure. what I'm seeing, the Catherine Project. So I'm, I'm sitting in my office. I am on fellowship at Princeton this year. I'm on sabbatical. And okay. Princeton is a very, very uh, career centric fo- place. Uh, it is absolutely the elite. It's the, the um, yeah. one of the most elite of the elite institutions. Uh, everyone's preoccupied with careers. Uh, I go to the Catherine Project, which is open to anybody, and all anyone wants to talk about is the Phaedrus or something like that. So you you have a reversal, truthfully, in many cases. Of um, it, you often find further down the the social totem pole, the academic totem pole, uh, more of an interest in liberal learning than you would at the top. It's very, so something's happened. Yeah, yeah. I, um, how that all works out, I don't know. I think one of the things, one of the stories about the 20th century that maybe not told quite enough, and it's a bit of a, it it's, goes alongside the story you tell, but it's it's also different, is that um, learning for its own sake was also democratized. So the Great Books programs, for instance, the one at St. John's or the one in Chicago, or the one in Columbia, the famous um, Great Books programs from the 20s and 30s, they're they're directed at bringing liberal learning to everybody. Uh, they're not, so it's, you take this classical education that used to be aristocratic and sure. you bring it to everybody. So I, and I think that that's it's also part of the Adam Smith uh, vision of education from Wealth of Nations where, you know, you, you have this human diminishment that's produced by factory labor um, or mm-hmm. other kinds of hyper-specialized labor and education comes in and restores the dignity of the person, yeah. um, gives the person a broader human perspective. Anyway, th- that might be a little bit of a yeah. jumble of ideas. Yeah, but yeah. You pick up whatever thread you want to. Um, yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, the thread that came to my mind, which is totally different direction than what I, where I thought we're, we're, what we could be talking about, but it gets kind of back to that, to what extent is is liberal learning, you know, an aristocratic sort of mode of education. And then and then maybe if you think about, okay, well, why your observation that today it actually seems to be almost not maybe inversely correlated where it's people who are not in the elite institutions, you know, living ordinary working lives that have an interest in the liberal arts. And so then you maybe think about, okay, what is the, you know, the elite or the aristocratic class today? Um, you know, I guess with the idea of a natural aristocracy kind of in our context, um, you know, there is some movement or churn of people from the working and middle classes to the elite class. But I wonder if there's not some, to some extent, almost like a a status anxiety or because you have to make the climb from being a middle class person to the top, your, your, all of your focuses are on the material, on the credential, on getting ahead. And so you just don't have time for the contemplative life, but it's really the people who are not in that rat race, who are just being and working, who can actually learn for its own sake because they can afford to do that. I, I think what you're saying is right, but I think it's even, from what my experience, even more dramatic than that because okay. it's just... It's not just the middle class who are anxious and are trying to to secure their position higher up, trying to move themselves sure. up in the class. It's also that the wealthy are extremely anxious about maintaining their position. So, yeah. um, I mean, I've talked to people, parents, very wealthy parents, whose children are are totally are paralyzed by anxiety to the point where they're afraid to pursue a liberal arts education because they think they'll lose their their position. They, they, hmm. they also feel the need for this kind of, um, yeah. So there's, there's, that makes me think that it's, I don't know what the cause of it is. And um, it's, yeah. it's out of my understanding, the type of thing I understand. Sure. But it seems like it's not just the middle class that's preoccupied yeah. with advancing, but also the upper class that's, that's, that's preoccupied with maintaining their status. So there's a, yeah, a, a greater sense of, I mean, I think other people have said this, there's a greater sense of competition at the top. Um, that is that's taking away the capacity for leisure and leaving it elsewhere to be picked up. Hmm. Um, and do you think that's something, is this something, I don't know, new that's kind of accelerated, you know, in the last 30, 40, 50 years, or kind of looking back at liberal education in the American tradition, can you see other points in time when, when this, these changes happened? 
I, I can't say, honestly. Um, okay. All I can say is in the changes over the course of my life, um, middle class people and people who are just below middle class who want to advance into the middle class, um, they are much less uh, open to studying liberal learning. I mean, I didn't even, when I was a, when I was 17 years old and first starting off for college, and mind you, I didn't come from a wealthy family, not at all, but it never occurred to me, never occurred to me not to study liberal arts because it was somehow some kind of financial liability. Um, and I talk to students now who are concerned that studying Spanish you know, isn't sufficiently practical for a career. Um, whereas Even to me- just taking, taking courses in Spanish or majoring in Spanish? Being a major in Spanish, yeah. knowing, being, becoming fluent in Spanish, which strikes me as being a, a cardinally practical, incredibly useful kind of degree, which opens up multiple career opportunities. That's not seen that way. And I, I yeah. think it's actually, I, I, I'd be, I don't know what the explanation is, but I'm, I'm inclined to be quite skeptical that there's a reality that's being responded to. I think that um, university administrators and other leaders in, in our culture um, keep saying this over and over again, the liberal arts are impractical, liberal arts are impractical, liberal arts are impractical. And uh, I've never seen much evidence for it. All the liberal arts majors I know are quite successful in one way or another. Yeah. So I, I, I've never seen the evidence, but I still hear the refrain. The refrain. Um, so, so something else is going on, and I don't know what it is, but I think yeah. it's not true. I think it's just not true that liberal arts isn't practical. Yeah, um, yeah no, that's a good, yeah, interesting. Paradoxically, by, by, learning, by learning something for its own sake, you end up being more practically, you know, competent and useful than by just learning something practical. What uh, you brought up reminds me of when I... On that, if I could elaborate on that a little bit, just yeah, because yeah, that's go for something that's been on my mind. Um, it's, it has to do with the aspect of liberal arts as being fundamental. So, you know, if I think about it, and I have in my mind this, these cuts that were just being proposed at West Virginia University, which is like its major state flagship, and they're, they're proposing cutting their master's and PhD in mathematics, right? um, and it also all their foreign languages, all their majors in foreign languages. Um, so but if I think about the mathematics, okay, so they won't stop teaching mathematics, right? They'll teach it in applied contexts, so sure. math for engineering, yeah. math for this, math for that, math for economics, math for being an accountant. But if you think about it, it's much more useful to have a human being that has a certain level of basic mathematical ability that they can then use in whatever way um, life presents to them. They, can, they have a source of learning that can then be combined creatively in all kinds of ways. They can decide yeah. that math works for some, can help with something that it hasn't been used for before. Whereas if, if you're on these, these fixed career tracks, um, someone else has decided for you what's useful and what isn't. Yeah. And, and that seems to me obviously a diminishment of, of one's capacities. Um, that is, you learn what someone else has told you belongs to a field. But any real field, any field of any interest, in practical fields as well as theoretical fields, they are dynamic, they are flexible, they are responsive. And if you don't have those, those higher level skills, you're not going to be able to be a part of that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was reminded of when I, um, when I was in, a senior in high school, you know, I was kind of set on going to the University of Michigan and I got accepted and that was my childhood dream because I grew up there and I finally visited Hillsdale and I remember sitting through a class my dad came down with me and then afterwards my dad was you know we were talking with the professor kind of and I think he raised the question of well, what on earth is my son going to do when he graduates you know with a liberal arts degree and uh, I remember the professor who was Dr. Westblade saying you know well I'd be curious you know uh, John, who's my, my dad, if you look at your company and look in the C-suite, what undergraduate degrees did the people in that C-suite have? And so we went back home and we went on, you know, Google pulled it up and it turns out that the majority of them had, you know, they majored in classics or whatever, music, 
Um, they were all liberal philosophy, all liberal arts before, and then most of them ended up getting an MBA or something like that. But their foundation was all in the liberal arts. I don't know if that's true today, um, but I thought that was um, quite, yeah, that was quite interesting. And so we were sold and, you know, one thing led yeah. to another. Yeah. Uh, we have a few more minutes together. I'm wondering, what do you think is the proper relationship between politics and the liberal arts? Both, I would say, at a fundamental kind of level, but also in America today in 2023. So uh, this is an interesting question for me because I, the, my writing, for anyone who's familiar with it, in Lost in Thought and in some of the earlier essays, I'm very emphatic about it being liberal learning as being independent from politics. So it's sure. being in some way withdrawn from political concerns. Okay. And it's one of the things that I think people have found most controversial. And I think what I mean by that is that it's not um, topical. Liberal learning is not topical. It's not driven by the motivations of the moment. You can't do liberal learning if you're thinking about how to get um, the, a Democrat in the, in the presidency or a Republican in the presidency, or you're thinking about advancing a particular social justice issue, or you're thinking about advancing a particular, uh, the conservative versions of social justice issues. Um, yeah. So you, you can't, it's, it's not compatible. You, to, Time for liberal education is a time to withdraw from the world of contemporary power struggles. Um, that said, and I think this fits nicely with what the way we've been talking, that said, there is a way in which liberal education is extremely politically relevant, and that is that it's an education of a free person, that is, of a citizen. It, it's the education which gives you, uh, develops your power of judgment to participate in your community as a free member, as a free and equal participant in your political community. So part of that, in terms of what we've just been talking about, is you decide, you know, okay, the university administrators, along with whoever else, decide what a career is and what training for it is. But you, as a free person, you get to decide what ought to count as a career and what ought to count as a job and how what counts as a job or what counts as a career might be in some way up to you hmm. and up to your own creative endeavor because you are not just someone who receives jobs and careers and tasks, but you are a participant, an active participant in your community. In that sense, it's very political and, and crucial for political flourishing. Um, so both of those things are true. So I, I'd su yeah. I suggest to anyone who's starting college now, um, you know, t step back a bit from from the political in terms of the issues and the partisan issues, but um, but know that you are it, first of all those things will be right there when you get back, um, but also that you are preparing yourself for being a member of the local community in a in a special way that can't be replaced. That's great, um, and I, that does also remind me of when I was at when I was a student at Hillsdale. Uh, I don't think I checked the news for four years. You know, I just immersed myself in all of these great books. And I had come from a public school background, so I didn't never really read a lot of the stuff. And it was great. And now, of course, my career has kind of led to the intersection of both, you know, ideas and politics and education. And, you know, I get my share of that. Uh, but that really wasn't, you know, a big part of my undergraduate experience. Um, maybe to close, I, so one of my sort of a friend and an ISI professor, Josh Mitchell, had told me about 10 years ago, uh, he said, and it, it always stuck with me, that you should, instead of just reading, you know, you, there are so many great books that are, pub, not great books, but there's so many interesting popular books published every year, and, and a lot of people who are on Twitter, whatever, spend a lot of time discussing and thinking about these things. I remember he said, it's better to pick four or five really great books and to read them every year. You know, read them 10 times, 20 times, be with, have them be your companion for your whole life. You'll have more to say about current events if you do that than if you keep up with all these books being published year over year. Um, and he was able to name a couple that were influential to him. Uh, I think Augustine's City of God, Plato's Republic were two of them. Uh, 
democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville was another. So I'm curious if you agree with that advice. And if so, what are the, I don't know, three to four books that have been with you for, for years that you keep coming back to? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I agree 100% um, that having a few books that you read regularly, the, the, the thing, what makes a great book a great book is that it continues to bear fruit for you, no matter what your level of education is, no matter what your stage of life is, no matter what the changes in circumstances, that's part of what makes a great book great. Um, so for me, um, you know, you mentioned Plato's Republic, which of course has, I've been reading more or less my whole life, um, uh, Augustine's Confessions. Um, I, I think quite a lot about the book of Genesis. That's a book that's been traveling with me, maybe not quite my whole life, but at least 10, 20 years at this point. Um, it's, it's a book that, that's been very fruitful for me um, in, in, in thinking and reflecting on things that are going on. Um, and then uh, I feel like I should say something modern, uh, but I'm not sure. Those might be the, 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 the old three. books, the ones that, that really stick out for me. Sure. Um, have, you, have you by chance, I'm sure you, you probably have, I took a course um, on Anglo-Saxon medieval lit, and there's all this wonderful medieval poetry, you know, re poetic retellings of Genesis, Genesis B and all these other things. I'm sure, have you spent much time with I, those I, texts? Just, just the past couple of years, I've been getting really interested in, in um, okay. medieval literatures, especially Middle English and Old English. But yeah. I'm not, I just don't know enough about it at this point um, to, 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 to say which is my central text. But it's definitely, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and I, I love to read. Um, yeah, I, lo I love to get back to the beginning of English and think about how it's developed definitely. and read the old literature. So, yeah. That's great. Well, I think we're about out of time today. Thanks so much for joining, Zena. If people are interested in reading more of your work or getting involved with the Catherine Project, where should they look? Uh, I have a website, um, zenahits.net, but also my Twitter. Um, and yeah, look at catherineproject.org. Um, and uh, I have the, the book that's most connected to liberal education we've been talking about is uh, Lost in Thought, hmm. uh, which came out a few years ago. And uh, check that out if you're interested. And uh, yeah, that's where I'd send them. Great. Well, thanks so much. And thank you all for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to visit our website, isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Collect Modern Age articles, and of course, the podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.